Right, thank you Susie. Um, good afternoon everyone. What I want to talk about today is something that's arisen out of my recently completed PhD research, which I finished last year, where I was taking a narrative theory approach to understanding how the Mesolithic period in Britain was communicated to public audiences across a range of different communication media, both uh, verbal and visual. So what I'm going to talk about today is one very, very tiny part of, of that research. And in fact, it's going to be looking at how the issue of how human environmental interactions can be conveyed in narratives and whether we are the best people to create those narratives or not. And a lot of what I'm going to say is, re is repeating what other people have said already in this session and perhaps building on, on some of what's been said already. And uh, taking, taking your advice, I'm going to define my terms at the beginning uh, and where I get all this from. And I've been using people like David Herman, the narrative theorist, uh, who defined the basic elements of narrative in his view, accounts of what happened to particular people and their experience of what happened. And there are things you might note amongst his key elements of, of what he thinks narrative is, uh, a structured time course of particular events, conveying the human experience of experiencing the event in the story world. Okay, so bear that in mind. Now, going further on, uh, looking at what Seymour Chapman had to say in the 1970s, one of the founding figures of, of narrative theory, defining how narratives are structured. What are the constituent elements that make a narrative? Well, he says you need the two existents, that's characters, people, individuals, and the settings within, within which they, they operate. You also need the events, that's the actions that people do, and the things that happen to them which actually disturb the equilibrium and move the narrative forward, move the story forward. You can then look at people like um, Felon and Rabinovitz, much later in 2012, who looked at why do stories have an effect on people, on the reader or the viewer. Uh, he, they isolated three particular aspects of narrative which were important. The mimetic, that is how believable is the story world that you've created in which they operate. The synthetic, which is the actual medium you use to tell the tale, the aesthetics of the telling of the tale. How attractive is that? And the thematic, which is how resonant is the story with something in the experience, background or beliefs of the person who is the reader or, or the viewer of the story. So bearing those in mind, uh, we can look at what archaeologists have said about the use of narrative. I've counted 44 separate articles by archaeologists saying we should start to write stories since 1989, since Ian <coughs> Potter began this in the late 1980s. And they're all very repetitive. They all largely say the same thing. Uh, so here's Brian Fagan, um, one of, a key American, well, British writer who works in, in the United States, uh, who writes a lot of popular archaeology works and does so really quite successfully. His rule number one, always tell a story and the stories lie in the people behind the artifacts a lot of archaeologists are really enthusiastic about the artifacts and i speak as a flint nerd <laughs> who began my career in, in, as a lithics analyst and i still need hospitalizing if i've been caressing a neolithic new shaped arrowhead for too long right but the stories lie in the people not the artifacts uh, Rosemary Joyce has, has written very uh, cogently about the fact that narrative is actually part and part of what archaeologists do. We create stories in our analysis of the past. We are a discipline engaged in the present in construction of persuasive stories about imagined pasts. We overlap with novelists and fiction writers, in other words, in what we actually do as part of our work. On the other hand, there are many archaeologists who have pointed out many times that archaeologists are actually not very good at writing. <laughs> uh, here's Richard Bradley in 1996. The pressure of academic writing leads archaeologists to suppress subjectivity and go for description and documentation. The third person passive voice of academic writing is the death knell of readability. Uh, Mark Kluchenik um, says that prehistorians in particular have been very conservative in their attitude to narrative. 
we tend to use this hindsight view, speaking from outside the action, and we're really not very good at getting into the heads of people in prehistory in the past. Um, Jung, in 2002, wrote that he was baffled by why so few archaeologists write popular accounts and says that most archaeologists are not trained in storytelling but are trained to be bad at storytellers and that much archaeological writing is dry and bloodless. Now, yes, a lot of it is, but I think there are archaeologists who do write well. There are archaeologists who can write good stories. But we can also learn to work with others and work together across archaeologists and writers and, and have a partnership with them. And in working with people for whom writing is their profession, novelists, short story writers, filmmakers, that kind of thing, we're working with people who understand the essential elements that make a narrative work. There are things we are very good at. We are very good at providing the setting, the story world, and providing some indication of the happenings that impinge on that story world. What we are less good at is understanding the, the, the characters, the individual characters that take, take part in our prehistoric stories, and the actions, the everyday, daily, particularized actions that, 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 they, that they perform. And it's the writers we work with, the novelists who can provide us that insight into character and action and that subjectivity which, which is trained out of us in our university degrees. So, to come to the Mesolithic. Um, we're very good at understanding the broad time scale. We've talked about scale already. And yes, we provide the large scale. We know the large scale climatic events. We know the jumps in, in global temperature. We know, yeah, hey, the Younger Dryas has come to an end. Fantastic. You know, brilliant. <coughs> yes, what does that mean in actual practice? Well, what I want to suggest is that we might learn from, I'm going to present you with a couple of examples of novels of fiction set in the Mesolithic, in the Mesolithic of a writer's imagination. These are the two novels, Margaret Elphinstone's The Gathering Night and Stephen Baxter's Stone Spring. The Gathering Night is a tale set in a world which is affected by a tsunami. Building on what we now know that happened in the North Sea with the Storica slide tsunami in the uh, mid to late Mesolithic, this takes that idea and Margaret looks at what the, the effect, <coughs> sorry, the effect of that on people would have been at the time. <coughs> the tsunami devastates a group of coastal people called the Lynx people of whom there are just four survivors. Those four survivors find that their, their hunting grounds, their settlements have just been wiped away and destroyed. So they head inland. As they go inland, they encounter other groups of people. <clears throat> so one of the survivors, Kemen, is taken in by the family of Nekane, of the Orc people, and marries a local woman, Osani. <clears throat> Here are the family relationships. Kemen's brother, however, Basajan, stays with another group of people called the Heron people. But he's been affected a bit by the, by the tsunami. He's become far more conscious about how he needs to survive and less about the group that he belongs to. They don't get on with the Heron people. They don't conform to the societal norms. They're basically suffering post-traumatic stress. The society at the time doesn't know how to deal with this, so they get expelled from the Heron people. And so Vasajal and his cousin Echite go wandering off, and they come across this chap, this hunter, called Bakar, with a dolphin that he's just hunted. They kill Bakar to get the dolphin, because they're hungry, they need food. They then wander on and they come across the Orc people. And they come in. Bastion is reunited with his brother Kenan. <coughs> and they're welcomed into the Orc people. But there is a problem. <coughs> Bakar, whom they killed, was Nekane's son. This becomes apparent. 
So, Basajan is a murderer who has killed one of the people, of the very people he's now come and, and been given shelter by. This results in he and Ekites being hunted as a ritual by the rest of the clan, saying, right, you've got to make amends for this, we're going to hunt you. And if we kill you, then that's made amends for it. They're hunted, they're killed. Eventually, Kemen and Asani have children. They have two children. This clan believes in reincarnation. The spirits of Bakar and Basajan are reborn as the two children of Kemen and Asani, <coughs> healing the breach and healing the crime and the division in the acts. What Margaret Elkinson's novel does <coughs> is take a climatic event and turn it into something which allows an exploration of a matrilocal society, the gender of shamanism, ideas of reincarnation, spirituality, and justice, and how society works. Margaret Elkiston herself worked with an archaeologist, Caroline Wickham Jones, for two years to develop an understanding of what the Mesolithic was like from archaeological evidence, and what hunter-gatherer society was like from archaeological evidence. And in Margaret's wonderful words, I love this, in the blank spaces between the words of archaeological narrative lie the buried kernels of all the forgotten stories. We forget the stories, Margaret comes along and gives us those stories and makes a believable word for us. Now, to Stephen Baxter's novel, Stone Spring, he sets this in a mythical land called Northland. Northland, you will notice, is Doggerland, the southern half of the North Sea, dry lands through most of the early and middle Mesolithic, connecting Britain across to Denmark. He sets it in the settlement of Echelua, right at the top end of Northland, a coastal settlement. Now, rising sea levels eventually wash away and drown Northland, Doggerland. But the interesting thing about Stephen Baxter's novel is that he has a family, a daughter, Anna, and her father. And Anna has a sister, Zessie. Zessie doesn't get on with her father. Anna gets on and dotes on her father. The father is killed out at sea by a tidal wave that comes in as part of the drowning of Doggerland process. Anna decides, well, bugger that, I'm not having this, sea level rise, huh, no, no thank you, I'm going to build a wall. <laughs> so, she yeah. this thing. build a wall, stop the sea flooding, flooding Northland. Where does she get this idea from? Because in Northland has come a trader who's come up across Europe, across the Rhine, up, up the Danube, and has come from the Middle East, a trader called Novu. In the Middle East, of course, at this time, they're building settlements with walls out of clay. Hence the idea, let's build a wall, let's, let's stop the drowning of Doggerland. Um, the settlement, however, is eventually, you know, the settlement is drowned first, and then they build a wall. Um, Zessie is a bit pissed off at this. She didn't get on with her father anyway. What are you doing building a wall? That's rubbish, you can't stop the sea. And eventually Zessie buggers off and goes off to the east amongst the Pratani in modern day Britain. Lots of things happen. There's a war. The Pratani attack the survivors of Zetralur, enslave them. Anna fights back, defeats the Pratani, and everything, oh god, it's wonderful, isn't it? Right? And Anna and Nova get married. Brilliant. The wall survives, and eventually the wall is built across the whole of the top of, of Northland. And Northland survives into the Bronze Age and beyond. And there's a whole series, I think it's a trilogy of novels that Stephen Baxter sets in this fictional Northland, which survives the flooding behind this wall. It's a wonderful example of a sort of counterfactual narrative uh, where, in which it, it, there is an exploration of violence, hierarchy, sexuality and gender. I forgot to mention that Nova is gay in this, the, the, the merchant who comes up from, from the Middle East. Uh, and gender differences between the male-dominated Pritani and the female-dominated uh, people of Echelur in the centre of Northland, uh, and contrasts different kinds of societal makeup. A society where you share versus a society where you accumulate. Uh, the ideas of trade and connections between peoples and the passage of ideas and all these sorts of things are explored. It's an imagined past. It's a counterfactual imagined past which allows the exploration 
of new ways of seeing the world and bringing back people into our narratives of Doggerland. We know the environment of Doggerland through Vince Gaffney's team, their excellent work. We now can plot the river valleys in Doggerland. Well, what about people who live there? And so I would say that we have two novels which are both very good in contrasting ways. Uh, the Gathering Night is based on evidence and a sense of realism and truth to, or to the archaeology. The Stone Spring is an imaginative counterfactual that goes against the archaeological evidence, really, in a way. But both are very valuable, both are excellent imaginings of a real world with real people responding to uh, environmental events. And as Adrian and Mary Pratzelis say in 2015, uh, in their work on narrative and archaeology, uh, narrative provides the intersection of large events with individual lives, and it's that that gives stories their power. Narratives should be based around the lived experiences of real named people. And it asks our work with authors, for whom this is a specialisation, what, what they do for a living, that helps us marry the two together. So archaeologists and fiction writers, yes, let's work together and produce some really great stories. Thank you very much indeed.